Science Unscripted. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Science Unscripted. It's Connor here. And Gabe. And uh, we are in black hoodies, black hooded sweatshirts today to talk a little, little bit about Black Death. The mother of all pandemics at the end of the 1300s, the late 14th century. So I just looked this up. The peak, at least in Europe, was between 1347 and 1351. Mid, mid 14th century is what there I was go. trying to say. There we go. The um, question is how severe it was or how much of the world's population or Europe's population, the bubonic plague, the Black Death wiped out. Uh, it's a contested debate, but now we might have proof. Of how many people died? Well, where they died most. And bef I guess before we get right into it, what I want everyone to think about out there, we've all lived through a pandemic to some extent. And try to imagine if we didn't have written records or digital records of where people died when, how would you figure that out? If there was, if there was nothing, how would you possibly travel back in time and figure out, I mean, and I'm not talking about exhuming skeletons. That is such an easy question. Pollen. Pollen. Pollen is the answer. Pollen. Pollen. <laughs> Science Unscripted. My name is Adam Izdebski. I am an environmental historian. Um, and recently, my colleagues and me published a study using natural scientific data to verify the extent of Black Death mortality in Europe. So, Adam, I guess what jumped out at me about your research is that apparently the plague didn't reach everywhere in Europe. There, there were like pockets of, of people who just didn't get the plague. They, they survived it that way? Yes. And the mystery is that there are three plagues, at least bubonic, septicemic and pneumonic. It can be in your blood. It can be in your lungs. It can be in your lymph nodes. So and they have different um, you have different chances of dying. Um, depending on which one you get, and they spread in different ways. So it's like a couple of diseases caused by the same bacterium with different spread mechanisms. And it's really difficult when you think about 600 years ago to figure out which one was at work where. Probably all of them were acting in some kind of synergy um, in different places at different times. But even if we're not sure exactly which kind of plague was happening where or or exactly how people were infecting each other or animals were infecting humans, you and your team were still able to track the consequences of those infections regardless, through, through pollen. Yes. Yes, this is exactly what we tried to do. I mean, we see the changes in the landscape. So it's like, you know, not primary consequence. We don't know what was happening to humans, but we know what was happening to the landscapes in which they were living and which they had to maintain for their action, mostly farming. And the, the logic behind that is that if, if every other person died, if half the population died, then there just wouldn't be enough workers? Or, or what, what is the logic yes. behind that? There wouldn't be enough people to work the land the same way and to the same, on, on the same scale. Because it was, you know, before mechanized farming, even to use animals, you needed a human to, you know, take care of and direct the animals. So if you suddenly have, you know, have the amount of humans, you are no longer able to do the same stuff. What? But it's difficult to say what kind of percentage of mortality it relates to. Yes, we are able to say there was a catastrophe. There was no catastrophe. So there is a lot of work to do still. And there's no way that your data could be flawed by something like a, a blight? I mean, if, if a lot of crops happened to die off, you know, due to some infectious disease that affected certain cereals or certain grains or something, um, and then they would vanish and you would think, oh, they died of plague. But I guess that's, that's clearly not the case here. I mean, we have no records of something like that happening at the time. And I would imagine that people would, you know, they would write it about, about <laughs> it somewhere. And it's also the question of where it would, when it would happen, yes? Because uh, we are, like, the key season is, like, let's say in Germany, it would be between April, June, something like that. Perhaps more June, like Mayish, Junish, when cereals, if we think about cereal growing, when it pollinates. What happens afterwards? If it was all destroyed by storms, we don't care. Yeah. Because we know how much they plant it, kind of. Yeah. But yeah, what if it was like a really big windstorm and blew all the pollen away, for instance? 
It could be the case, uh, but it's. I mean, <laughs> it's. I, I probably should talk to my friend's palynologist to be able to answer it better. Um, the, we could imagine some strange conditions at the moment of pollination that would, you know, distort the record. Uh, but I think it's too consistent also with what we already know. So we show catastrophe in our data where the catastrophe is really genuinely attested in the written evidence. It's not attested in the written record everywhere in Europe, only in a few specific regions. And some of them we have the pollen data and we actually show that um, the catastrophe is visible in the landscape. What were, according to what you found, some of the places in Europe where the bubonic plague was absolutely devastating? So one such place would be southwestern Germany, Baden-Württemberg. Um, this is very, very strong decline in, in cultivation and in human activity in the landscape. Another such place is central Italy. And this agrees very well with the um, written sources, with the records that we have from the period. Um, another such place, and it's very interesting, it's Greece. And here it seems like there is a really very profound collapse of the landscape. So also no increase even in forest cover, something strange happening to pasturing activities. It was hit really hard and perhaps this is now like wild speculation. The extent of the Black Death crisis in Greece has to do with the collapse of, of the disappearance of the Byzantine Empire a few generations later. The reason I asked that question of w w there would be anything that would indicate why it, why it spread so so um, so severely? This is a very good question. So I would say we cannot blame, we cannot use like one factor to explain that. Grain trade or population density or tempor average temperatures, like there is no single factor that explains the pattern. But what explains it is the plague ecology. Because plague, and there are different forms of plague, um, is very deadly if not treated immediately with antibiotics. So today, if within 24 hours of the symptoms you get antibiotics, you, s you have very good chances of survival. It was not like that. Th there are different plagues, but it was basically really bad in uh, prior to the antibiotics. Um, but the question is how likely you are to actually get the plague. Because if you get it, you're kind of doomed. But if you, But you still, you know, what is the chance of getting it? And this is very complex, very complicated ecology of plague that um, can help us explain that. Yeah, I mean, it leads to really for me the, the fundamental question, why didn't the plague kill everyone in Europe? Like, why did anyone survive? Yeah. Why did anyone survive? Because it didn't reach everywhere. So just to give you an example of how difficult it is in some way uh, to get killed within 24 or let's say 48 hours, which is possible. So you have pneumonic plague. So basically plague bacterium, because plague is a bacterial disease, not um, virus. Um, the bacterium Yersinia pestis, which we know for 100 years. If it gets into your lungs, you have very bad chance, like you have 90 or 100% certainty that you will die if you don't get antibiotics. But it's in order to get it there, you have to breathe in the air of somebody who's dying of plague, to put it very simply. And you have to come really close. It's not coronavirus. So like you have to take care of your dying husband, for instance, and breathe it in. And then, you know, you're done as well. So it's not that, you know, it spreads everywhere very easily and everyone, uh, you know, is, is certain to die. And this is just one of the example. And this is like extreme case of plague that is not that frequent. Do you see any parallels to the to the research that you've just done uh, to the pandemic that everyone has lived through, been living through um, any any in terms of how it's spread or hasn't spread is is the coronavirus comparable? So, of course, it's very different because coronavirus now is a human disease and plague is basically a rodent disease. Rats, marmots and stuff like that, mostly in the wild. And it kind of spills over to human populations from time to time. But it's too deadly 
to you know sustain itself among humans too deadly for humans so this is a very big difference that we have zoonosis as we call it technically so animal disease really that comes to humans and a human disease now with coronavirus and coronavirus spreads very easily but still there is a very good lesson to learn science unscripted and again that was adam isdebski he was talking to us from berlin there uh, from the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. Yeah, pretty, pretty cool to be able to uh, combine, what, what is it, archaeology and, and history and virology all in one. Palynology, all through the power of palynology. I just, yeah, I, I had thought... The Black Death. I had thought that, that the plague was a settled debate. I thought that was, I thought we knew. I, I had assumed because it was so widespread that it was obviously aerosols, just like, um, you know, the majority of the infections that happened as a result of the coronavirus, aerosol-based, breathing out, breathing in, in a, in a room like this one. That's, I, that's I, not clear. I, I, I knew that there were rats involved, I did, but I didn't know that they were the principal movers of the bacterium. Yeah, this, this Yersinia pestis behind us here. That it was the, the fleas on, on these rats and, and not... That, you know, people that spread the disease amongst themselves. Well, and also we know that, but imagine not not knowing where this thing is coming from, and not only not knowing, uh, not knowing how the infections are happening. Um, no, no antibiotics, no, uh, no chance. There's nothing you can do. You, you. I mean, if you think some people have been fatalist about getting the coronavirus, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if it would have been better back then to just assume. Or can you imagine some of the scapegoating that we've seen during this pandemic, these past two years? What must have been going on back then in the mid 1300s? Oh, like trying to find who's to blame for all this death everywhere, depending on where you are in Europe. Um, that must have been insane. Yeah, and again, this is a this is a pandemic, the 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 plague that peaked in Europe over the course of four, or you could even say five years. That's a long time. That's we're talking about the peak of it. How awful to have lived through that time period—a period of time where fifty percent of the people uh, would have ultimately perished. Um, not not comparable. As much suffering and you know the human losses and grieving and yeah. lockdowns yeah, and yeah, pain. Yeah. The, this, the, the coronavirus pandemic has caused the compare the comparable uh, inconvenience that we've been dealing with uh, over the past two years. At this point. Everyone in the world would say this has to end now. Could you imagine back then? <laughs> yeah, no operation light speed. No, no. <laughs> we have it pretty good here uh, in, in 2022, despite the fact that sometimes um, it feels like a difficult time. It is a difficult time. Yeah. But and it, what, we, what we've learned also from Adam is that the, it's really complicated. There are a lot of factors when it comes to the idea of a spread and how it spreads and tracking that spread. And um, yeah, well, let's, let's, let's consider ourselves lucky. That's a good way to leave this one. If you have any questions, you can email them to us. Our email address is right back up there, su at dw.com. Leave a comment in the comment section below. We read every single one. And uh, as you can see, if you're a subscriber, we, we reply to a lot of them. At least mm -hmm. we are right now. Till we, till we lose control and can't do that anymore, yeah. we'll be doing that. We also have an email address, su at dw.com. We, we, I particularly like those. I just said I that. I, I just said that. I wasn't listening. <laughs> Thank you. See you guys. Science Unscripted.